Good evening, everyone, and welcome. I would like to call to order this special meeting of the Bloomington City Council, Monday, August 21st, 2023. Thanks to everyone here in the chambers and everyone watching online. This is a, a meeting where we are going to talk, uh, our one organizational business item is item 2.1. We're going to talk 2024 preliminary tax levy and general fund budget discussion. It's our first official budget discussion as a council for the season. Uh, so we're going to dive right into it. We've got uh, Kari Carlson, our deputy finance officer. I thought you were the budget director or budget manager. Or the new, new title, very good, uh, to lead us through this. And council, we're, we're going to go through it. And I, and I hope you've had a chance to look through the, the package. Good information there and a good starting point. And looking forward to the discussion as we go along. So I will turn it over to Kari. Good evening. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor. Good evening, Council. This evening on the agenda, I'm going to go over the budgetary approach for 2024, talk about public engagement that we've done and will continue to do. I'm going to talk about some uh, revenue analysis, expense drivers. We have a working model to share with you for a preliminary tax levy for 2024, and then talk about some dates uh, for the budget calendar. <coughs> So starting off with the budgetary approach, there is definitely still a continued focus on investments in public safety. We were focusing on maintaining services that residents value and also a focus on a strategic allocation of resources. Also, we are working on aligning the budget requests with the city's strategic plan, Bloomington Tomorrow Together. And we also increased public engagement this year. And so as I said in our approach that we were um, ma making sure that we are aligning our budget requests with the strategic plan. So I have just the strategic plan here just to remind us that it's the mission statement is our mission is to cultivate an enduring and remarkable community where people want to be. And the three priorities that are there in color are a connected, welcoming community, a healthy community, and a community with equitable economic growth. And then below each one are those intended outcomes. And so those bullet points that are listed there for welcoming community, people can connect with neighbors, that they're welcomed in the city that residents feel valued. And then in a healthy community, it's um, environmental health as part of that, human health, of course, and then also safety and security. And then with the equitable economic growth, that the economic growth in Bloomington is more equitably distributed, that there's expanded diversity in business ownership and equitable job growth for workers. So uh, we'll start off here talking about public engagement. So we nearly doubled the amount of events that we were at for public engagement. So we went from seven to 13 this year. And we also made sure that those were in different locations around the city. Um, they were different days of the week, different times of the week. We also had a lot of department heads and council members um, joining at those, at those tables, which was wonderful. And um, some of the different events that those included were open houses, like the public works open house, the police open house, kids shows, um, outdoor concerts, and farmers markets. So places around the city where there were a lot of people gathered. So to date, we've done 10 of those events. Uh, we started in May. And we have um, had interactions with over 600 residents at those uh, budget tables at events. And there's still three more to go. So we have one coming up this weekend on August 26th at the On The One Music Festival. We're going to be at a, another farmer's market. We've already done one. We'll be at another one in September. And then we will be at the fire department open house in October. And then along with that, we have a virtual option that we also, we've advertised online and we've also advertised that at the budget tables for a Let's Talk Bloomington page. And to date, we've had 266 uh, survey responses. 
And so here are some uh, more pictures of us at different events with our budget activity. And you know, I'll say this is not a scientific survey, but it's definitely relevant. And it's a way to get out into the community and talk about what the city is spending money on and get their feedback um, and just find out where their priorities are with city spending. Um, so what the game is, just to refresh your memory there, you can see it. And we've upgraded it a little bit. Um, in, in how we presented it. So it's a structure that has six different categories of spending, and I'll get into those in a second here. And then uh, we give people 10 chips that represent property taxes or money, and we let them decide where they would like to, where they think the city should spend that money and say that they can put them all into one category or they can split them up evenly, just to give us a kind of a visual sense and of uh, where they think the money, city should spend the money and then let them know that we're sharing that with city council. And then along with that, we're also, um, we always have an easel. We have something similar on the Let's Talk Bloomington site where we're asking uh, where do you think, um, what do you want the city council to know about your priorities for city services? And so we've had a lot of feedback this year, and so too much to read through it all tonight. But I did include that in the public agenda that's been published so that you have that and the public has that as well. So here are the results to date of what we've received being out in the community. And you can see these six different um, categories and I, as I said the feedback that goes along with this that we've been gathering just free form feedback is uh, published in the council packet so the the one that has had the most chips so far 25 percent is the category of parts parks arts recreation and natural resources and so then in the little bullet points there we had listed out uh, playgrounds, trails, recreation programs, arts programs, and also protection of natural resources. So, so far that has had the most when we're going out into the community. That second one there, facilities and infrastructure. So the ice garden facility, the center for the arts facility, the golf course, a clubhouse at Duan, um, community health and wellness center, roads and bridges, sewer and water, that um, has received about 16%. Um, when people are, are doing this budget activity. And then the third category there, equitable economic growth, which included the, the sub-bullets of affordable housing, economic growth that's more equitably distributed, expanded diversity in business ownership, and equitable job growth for workers. As I'm kind of reading through these, these you can see these are aligning with our strategic plan that we have, Bloomington to Brown together. Um, and that had 12%. And then... For public safety, um, increased safety and security, it included police, fire, dispatch, and legal. Um, that has had 23%, and so that um, so far is the second one, like if you're looking at the total chip amounts. Um, depending on the different events we're at, those seem to go back and forth a little bit. Um, fifth one there, healthy community, um, includes environmental health and human health and that has about 14%. And then the last one, Connected Welcoming Community, that title's also one of the strategic priority main categories. And um, the people can connect with neighbors, they're welcomed by the city, and residents are valued. So um, that one had about 10%. So that's where it's coming uh, to date. And then if we go to, this is the online. Um, so again, there is, I think, 28 pages of, of comments, um, so 173 written responses. And this was a little different, we're a little limited in what we can do with Let's Talk Bloomington on the survey. So what's different about this is there, um, when you're doing it in person, you have the option to put all of your chips in one category or leave one out completely. When you're ranking, you have these six categories, and you would rank one through six with one being your highest. You have to rank them all. So uh, we did have a little bit of feedback about that they would like to not have one at all in there. But they did to, to complete this, you had to rank them. And so for this one, it is very similar to what we're seeing when we're going out in the community, but it's a, a little different. So this one, public safety, is the first, the highest priority ranked followed by parks, arts, recreation, natural resources. 
And then the other ones there um, are actually falling the same way as when we go out into the community. And then I uh, just wanted to highlight as well, um, you know, we heard from the council that you enjoyed or thought that it was a good idea to do some video communications to get out to the public. So um, as you know, we, uh, the city assessor, Tim Bulger, and I did a video back in February to give information about the property tax statements and the home valuation statements that were about to come out in March. And then uh, the Bloomington Today show, the, the Buzz, the weekly show, in June they featured a story about um, that we would – be out in the community and about the Let's Talk Bloomington page. And um, so we've got a lot more communication out so that residents know that this is available. Um, and then also, of course, in the briefing as well. All right, so that's public engagement. And now I'm going to just talk can, a little bit. Oh, yes. Just, uh, yes. As we break these down by agenda, I know. Sure. Uh, Council, any questions on the public engagement in the comments? Council Member Nelson? Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Um, <clears throat> just one quick comment. I think this is really good information. I did have a conversation at the Public Works event about kind of sort of how scientific this is, and I just wanted to reiterate, this is not a scientific survey. This is a casual conversation. People come there. Um, I think one of the concerns that the resident raised is there was kids putting things in things, and, and I told them very flat out, like, well, kids have opinions too and they're members of our community and they also were there guided I believe by their grandparents in understanding what those things were but these are not this is not a scientific survey of how they rank them this is informal but I think informative I mean the the consistency between the two different methods of gra grabbing this information I, I I think does tell a story that you know people really value that public safety they value the parks and the, th the things that we're looking at there so um, I think this will come up later in our conversations of where we're investing the money but that that I guess that's my comment and, and I think it's a good comment councilmember Nelson and I think it's also worth noting while this is a is in no way a scientific or, or statistically significant or, or accurate survey we do do those and uh, I, we do them a couple of times uh, in a couple of different ways uh, we have over the past few years. And frankly, we're seeing kind of the same results uh, with our statistically significant and, and reasonable and, and official and robust surveys that uh, they kind of match up with what we're seeing here in a lot of different ways as well. But more than anything, you're exactly right. This is a conversation starter. This is an opportunity to express opinions, to talk a little bit, to meet with staff, to, to, to basically share their opinion in, in a variety of different ways. Councilmember Lohman? Basically on the same lines, uh, and I know this is a non-scientific piece, um, one comment that struck me as I was reading through the uh, uh, anonymous uh, uh, responses uh, was that uh, um, that people could fill us out multiple times. Is that is that true? It could could one person go in here and fill out, you know, fill out 10 times? I don't know why. <laughs> what else you wouldn't have in your life going on to <laughs> fill out these things. But... Uh, um, <laughs> But is that, is that a possibility you could do that? Yes. Uh, Mayor, council members, council member Lohman. So the, the Let's Talk Bloomington survey, when, it, when Let's Talk Bloomington first rolled out, it was very locked down and you had to have a, a login, username, and password in order to fill out a survey. And the uh, Communications Outreach Engagement Division realized that was hindering a lot of people from logging on and and filling out the surveys and getting you know feedback. So for this survey and some other surveys they've done, they took that off, and so it is anonymous. And if someone did want to go on there and do it multiple times, they could. Hopefully, people aren't doing that significantly where it's really skewing the data. Um, I guess also they could do that if they're coming to our budget table events. Um, although I've been at all of them and I don't really recognize that many repeat people and I usually remember people pretty well. But um, but that, yes, that is a possibility. There, you you could uh, theoretically do it more than one And time. then in that, in that same light, there's no way to ensure that these are Bloomington residents either, right? I mean, I, I can't imagine somebody would you know, have that much of a <laughs> come in again and fill this out or, or show up to a, a table in Bloomington to, to, to fill it out. But 
just just so we're all on the same page as we as we look at this uh, look at this uh, information. Um, we're looking at this, you know. Obviously, Mary, you, you stated it uh, the best. The uh, surveys, wow, remarkably come out pretty similar when we do a scientific one. So um, it's interesting that it, you know that there isn't that much variation between the the, the different uh, uh, mediums. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Anything else, Council? If not, we're moving on. We are moving on. Okay. So here's a slide with one of the, um, a large amount of revenue that comes into the general fund. So property taxes is the, the largest amount of revenue that comes into the general fund, but uh, followed by that is lodging tax revenues. And as you recall, uh, due to the pandemic, that plummeted in 2020. So this is just showing uh, what happened with those lodging tax revenues. So in 2019, it was $8.7 million. In 2020, I have it highlighted in red there, it was only $2.8 million. And then it has started to come back. So 21, it came up to 5.1. 22 was at 7.9, which was higher than we had budgeted. Uh, we are projecting for it to be 7.8 at the end of this year, I just how things are looking, I think that probably will be higher than that, but that is what we budgeted and have conservatively forecasted right now. So based on the trends and what we're seeing, we're comfortable that for the 24 budget, that it, we have that forecasted at 8.4 million for the lodging tax revenue. And that's still not quite up to 2019. It's about 97% of that. So, um, but it's looking much better. And then just what I just went through, here's another way of looking at that more visually with a line graph. So I'll just point out that red line was 2020, um, that the green was 2019, and then yellow is 2023 to date. So you can see we're tracking pretty well uh, with 2019 for the lodging tax revenues. And then that this would be interesting to share as well, and this, these are just some um, recent months of some analysis that we received that we that assessing um, shared with us. And so, what this is showing is both an average daily rate, dollar amount per, per night, and then also an average occupancy percentage. And so. Um, on the left there is May, and then they're showing that as a percent. We keep kind of looking back at that pre-pandemic year of 2019, and so for May, it was looking really good um, as far, far as uh, percentage of rooms occupied compared to 2019, and then the, the revenue percentage, the, the average daily rate, was looking really good for May, uh, so that was a great month. Um, and then June was even better. And uh, part of that is uh, that Taylor Swift concert effect in June. Um, but I just thought that was just fun to see and fun to share that and a lot more positive than what we were looking at a few years ago. And then mission tax revenue, also a, a decent amount of revenue, not as large as the lodging tax, but also important and had gone down quite a bit. As you can see, it went from 1.7 million down to about 400,000 in 2020, and I think most of that was before things shut down. Um, but that has also come back and has gone over um, where we were in 2019. So that's a really great story. And um, 2022 was actually higher than our budget, and then we're projecting to be, our budget is 1.7 million for 23. That's probably also going to be a bit higher. Um, and then we have it going to 1.9 million. So we're actually budgeting higher for admission tax revenues than we were for 2019. And then, so that was the, the positive news for, for revenues. Um, and uh, in this, I don't know if it's necessarily bad, but it's just affecting our, our budget, is that the permit revenues are not um, as high as we've seen, or we're not projecting them to be as high as we, as we have seen. And um, you can just see there the actual numbers in 2019, 2021, 2022 was a record year for building inspections. Um, in part, it was due to um, industry changes for remote office working, 
Tenants reducing their footprint led to higher than average commercial permits for tenant remodels, as well as uh, additional um, an addition of several multifamily development projects, including this noble apartments that's shown right there. Um, and then also with uh, higher interest rates on the residential side, um, homeowners were encouraged to do to kind of remodel existing homes and pull permits for that as opposed to moving. So um, a lot of different factors in play there, but for 2023, we're only projecting 4.9 million and then even less in the 2024 budget. So pretty much the increases that we're going, that we're forecasting for next year for the lodging tax uh, revenue and the admission tax revenue are kind of wiped out with this decrease that we're forecasting for the permit revenues. Mr. Verbrugge. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Kari, on the 2023, we don't have the budgeted amount for permanent revenues. We're right around what we expect to bring in in terms of what we budgeted this year, right? So we're not expecting a shortfall this year. The reduction that we're looking at is a look forward expectation, correct? Yes, that's correct. We think we should meet budget this year. And we were forecasting a, that amount in the budget. Thank you. Council, anything on revenues? Council Member Carter? Uh, yeah, thank you. Can you go back to the lodging tax revenue slide? I just want to make sure I'm understanding. Um, so the one before this. Yeah, okay. So you were saying that in 2023, we projected $7.8 million, but we're more likely going to be above that. So, um, and then 2024, we're budgeting $8.4 million. But I thought you had said something about um, projecting less were you just referring to 2023 um i may have misunderstood when you were talking uh mayor council members council member carter um i think i was i don't remember what i said but um i know in 2022 we were projecting less than what we actually received so that 7.9 million was over budget okay so maybe that's if I didn't say that, I think that's what I was intending okay. to say. Okay, yep. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I may have missed something. All right. On to expenses. Okay. Okay, so for expense drivers in the budget, um, as a local government agency, um, public servants, a large part of our expenses is our people. So the salaries and benefits for the full-time, part-time, temporary, seasonal staff. So one of the overall high-level expense drivers is some expected labor market pressure and forecasting competitive salaries and benefits that just needed to attract and retain skilled personnel for the city. Um, we also, as you'll see, I'll get into a little bit more detail of a continued commitment to public safety as we are transitioning from a paid on-call part-time fire fighting department to hybrid of both part-time and full-time. And then just inflation, um, we're, we're seeing economic volatility affecting costs of materials and services. So. Just those drivers are um, definitely putting pressures on um, increasing expenses. So as I said, um, this is a budget still focused on an on investment and our, our public safety. So it was just a refresher from last year. So in 2023, we added uh, 21 new full-time firefighters. 18 of those were are funded for three years from the SAFER grant through FEMA. This budget request has an additional six full-time firefighters on top of that. Then for the 23 budget, that included four new police officers and a new dispatch employee, a dispatch training coordinator. And then in 24, budget that also includes an additional uh, dispatcher. Mr. Verbrugge? Uh, Mr. Mayor and Council Members, Kari, if you just go back to that real quickly. I just want to reiterate again this transition from our um, paid on-call um, 
fire department to a full-time, it's actually a hybrid with full-time and paid on call firefighters, is going to take us about a decade. Uh, so the initial investment last year uh, with the 21 firefighters uh, is dependent on adding about six new firefighters each year for about the next 10 years to get us to the level where we have parity amongst the uh, full-time firefighters and the paid on call firefighters to achieve optimal staffing. And that's a long-term plan. And I just wanna to continue to reiterate that for any folks in the community who are, are seeing this and, and wondering uh, about that transition. It's gonna take us a while to get there. The, the bottom line is that we just don't have the financial resources to make that significant of a tr transition in only a couple of years. So this is a long-term plan. Uh, this is the second year of the um, implementation of that plan, and we're going to see these investments subject to council approval for the, for the next probably 10 years. Thank you. So this is just expanding a bit more on what I just was talking about with the 21 firefighters, the four police officers, and the uh, dispatch training quality assurance coordinator in the 23 budget. Also in the 23 budget, uh, three other positions were added. There was a natural resources park keeper, a sustainability specialist, and a human resources representative within, this is in the, uh, the general fund. And in the 2024 budget, as I said, in the general fund, some proposed staffing changes is to add additional six full-time firefighters, one additional dispatcher, and then um, three, so these would not be new positions, but it would be changing from a part-time parks and recreation position to full-time. Um, there's three of those positions in this budget request. And so two of those parks and recreation uh, reclasses are um, to f reclassing from part-time to full-time are cost neutral in this budget, um, meaning that they don't have an additional impact. Um, that based on bringing, bringing these up to full-time, they're able to, to come up with cost reductions in other areas. And then um, the third one uh, would have somewhat of an impact. Um, so th that's what I have for the, kind of that section. And then I'm gonna, next going to go into the uh, kind of working model for the overall tax levy. Did you want to take a pause there? Council questions? Council Member Lohman. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so when we look at that driver's slide, um, mm -hmm. I think there were three different pieces there. And, and I don't want to put you on the spot. So if you don't have the answer for this, you know, this is just a preliminary conversation um, about it. I was wondering what percentage of, you know, if we look at these drivers, we would say, you know, 100% of this, of, of the driving change would be, you know, would it be, you know, 50%, you know, by labor market pressures, you know, or would that be 20%? Do you, do you have a sense of, of what of these, these drivers that you have up here? And I know there may be other ones that are not listed here. I know you probably just captured the, the, the three top main ones, but I just want to have a better understanding you know, as I, you know, as we look at these things and we contrast that with the mission statement that we, you know, kind of had earlier and how that is an obstacle to trying to accomplish those those goals. Yes, uh, Mayor, Council Members, Council Member Lohman, there's, in a few slides, I have a, some ways starting to look at that and how that, how you kind of break down the ta tax levy increase by department or by category, but we could do some additional work on top of that to get you the detail you need. That'd be great. Um, and then um, the other question that I have is that, you know, as we look at, you know, these, these staffing changes that we have here, um, you know, over, and I just want to take it overall. And if I'm looking at the, you know, kind of, I like the way that we've laid this out at the, at the very beginning of this, is we have, the, you know, our mission up there and we're trying to tie that to these, you know, is the city manager, and this is probably more a question for you, you know, looking at, you know, what our mission statement is around that connected and welcome community, a healthy community, and you know, the equitable and, uh, growth, and looking at each one of these positions and then tying those uh, to that. And then my, my follow-up question is, are we then looking at other staffing positions that maybe don't necessarily fit with, 
you know, those three things and looking to see if there's a way to, you know, over time phase those out because those are old commitments that we made in the past. Mr. Mayor, uh, council members, council member Loman. So the uh, staff uh, complement that we have currently, uh, I think is based on the level of services that residents have said they want and expect and uh, things that we are doing that are consistent with our strategic plan. If I look around the operations, uh, I think the the places where we see uh, um, staff above and beyond what we might call the core services uh, in our core departments or in our community outreach and engagement division, our office of racial equity and inclusion and belonging. And those are directly connected to the work that the council has been doing uh, as part of its strategic plan over the last six years or so. Um, so beyond that, uh, I think that what we're trying to do with this budget proposal is uh, continue the level of services at their current level and that's our current staffing complement, and then continue to make these investments in public safety. Uh, these couple other positions that were highlighted in here, um, we'll, we can talk about a little bit more when we get into the department reviews, um, but they are also tied to um, both service level and the um, strategic plan, um, and how we're trying to enhance the services that we're providing through recreation programming especially, uh, and volunteerism in the community and, and coordinating volunteers. So that's the, the proposal that's in front of you. What I would say from a, a bigger picture in terms of where we're at on staffing, we went through a, a rigorous process three years ago uh, during the pandemic with our, um, our budget advisory committee uh, that went through each of the departments and looked at the level of services. And we made uh, dramatic um, changes in 2020 going into 2021 based on the recommendations of the budget advisory committee. And um, we did see reductions in um, both our uh, operating staff and also some of the services that we provide. So we have not, uh, over the last couple of years, just tried to bring those programs or those positions back, what we have done when adding staff is look at what are the demands in the community and what is the council saying they want to accomplish uh, in adding based on that. So this hasn't been just a bringing back of positions that were el eliminated three years ago. Uh, it's been strategic investment is what's driving the staffing complement now. Thank you for uh, clarifying that. And I know earlier we had a conversation about uh, DMV because I know there are some folks that are still out there are asking about that. And I think really what I think the question is, um, that, that folks have, and I think you've answered this, is, um, you know, at that point in time, we were, were cutting positions uh, for, you know, for a reason. Um, uh, and now, you know, we're, we're adding different positions. And so, you know, the question, obviously, you know, as folks are faced with the, the pressures of inflation and with a shrinking uh, family budget, we saw that inside of the surveys there, um, you know, why can't, you know, our city control our, um, uh, our, our budget is the, is the kind of the question, you know, uh, and so I, you know, I, I've also seen on many occasions that other cities are also dealing with the same pressures as well, and I, I wonder if the manager would would talk about that at all. Mr. Mayor, Council Members, Council Member Loman, um, I'm happy to do that. Uh, I think that's a good sort of more in the wrap-up phase when when car gets through the presentation because i think it is important to put our you know the work that we're doing in the context of what's going on in the environment around us too and so i have some additional information related to that council member nelson yeah thank you mayor uh just a quick factual question here the uh park and rec jobs um do we only realize the cost reduction if we move from part-time to full-time or would we be able to realize those cost reductions without moving from part-time to full-time positions? Mr. Ruge? Mr. Mayor and Council Members, Council Member Nelson, uh, those are realized by moving to the full-time positions, yes. So uh, we wouldn't achieve those if we kept it part-time. Great. Thank you. Go ahead, Craig. Okay. Okay, so there is a lot of information on this slide. You've seen something similar to this before. So I'm just going to talk you through all the, the parts on here. So, um, like I said, this is a working model uh, for you to consider. And in the very first column is the 2023 
tax levy that was approved. And so the biggest portion of the property tax levy is the general fund. And that was at uh, just under $64 million. And so the biggest increase that we're proposing is also in the general fund um, to increase that to 70, uh, 70.4 million. And then um, other funds that receive property tax levy other than the general fund are also listed on this, this table. And so the communications um, uh, division has a special revenue fund, and we are looking at keeping that flat as far as the amount of property tax levy uh, subsidy. We also have an amount that we've been doing for quite a while um, that is go currently is going into the solid waste fund for uh, forestry or really disease tree removal. Um, and... I'll just say, I'm sure if you look through the comments, um, there's there's definitely a concern about uh, disease trees in Bloomington and, and also um, just forestry in general. But that is an amount that we've been setting aside for a while, knowing that the emerald ash borer disease was going to be spiking, and we're definitely spiking right now. Um, the fire pension fund is a special revenue fund. It's had some... Uh, it had some good investment years for a while there where we did not have to, our, the city's obligation to that fund was not as high as it has been in the past. Um, so we did actually bring that down last year from 1 million to 50,000 to down to 1 million. We um, are bringing that back up again. Um, uh, last year's results did not end as favorably as it had in the past for the fire pension with their investments. Um, for the aquatics fund, that we're bringing that up again slightly. Again, that was a, a reduction of that amount in the 23 tax levy, and that's because we've had some really great uh, summers for pools, so hot, dry, um, sunny, so they were having some good revenues. But as far as budgeting, you can't always – sometimes we've had some really wet summers that have been really bad for the pool as well, so we kind of just take a historic average. So um, right now we have that coming back up. There's a million dollars that is set aside for the art center fund, and we have that at the same amount. For the golf fund, the, um, when we started um, having a property tax subsidy for golf, it was to address um, the losses that we were seeing for the Highland golf course. And so for a, a while, we were um, had that amount to um, kind of help with the deficit for, for Highland. And so that amount that we have in the 2024 tax levy amount would kind of wipe out the, the rest of the deficit that we had for Highland. So we're bringing it down to just the amount that's left there. Um, for the ice garden, uh, we are keeping that at 125000 for the property tax levy for operations to help. And then the final one is... Um, it's a tax abatement amount that's part of the property tax levy, and that has to do with kind of road construction pro projects that are in the Normandale um, Lake District area. And so we had brought that down quite a bit um, during the pandemic, looking for some budget savings. That was something that the Community Budget Advisory Committee um, supported and the council also supported. So we're just kind of trying to, we've kept that there for a while, and we're trying to get that back up to be able to have enough funds for the projects that need to happen in that area. So that's what what um, considered the general revenues. And then the debt service amount, it's not um, a major um, increase compared to some other years. If you recall, in 23, um, we had two years of bonding. We knew interest rates were rising. Um, so that's kind of having a, a bit of an effect um, in the in what we have right now that we need to levy for. So all of that together is 9.49% increase overall. And then how that um, is reflected for a median value home in Bloomington. So that would equate to um, increasing it by $6.28 a month so that it would be um, going from about $111 a month to $117.37 a month. And that is a 5.65% increase to the median value home. And the reason that's so different, um, it just, and that's what's sometimes hard to um, 
convey or, or explain to the public that um, a lot of times what happens with the overall property tax levy change does not equate to what's happening um, like for the median value home, for example. So with com with um, how the commercial values increase in comparison to the residential values for this latest um, assessment, if you recall when we were back here in April and the city assessor, Tim Bulger, explained, um, that has a favorable effect for the median value home for 2024. So that was a lot that I just went through. Is there any questions or anything you'd like me to expand on? Council Member Martin. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, two quick ones for you, and, and apologies if this lives elsewhere in the presentation. Uh, with communications, I know with continuing questions around reduction in uh, franchise fees supporting a lot of that work, is that in there as a placeholder held flat at four hundred grand, or do we have an idea if we're going to see additional uh, revenue reductions coming in from fa franchise fees? Yes, um, Mr. Mayor, Council Members, Council Member Martin, um, we have a long-term model for the communications fund, and we will share that in more detail with the city council um, later in the year. But we, in that long-term model, we are seeing, we are forecasting that the franchise fees are um, not are kind of staying flat or not increasing much, or maybe even reducing. And so, when you're looking at the long-term model, that property tax increase is growing. Um, and you know some of the the expenses that are in there when we started having property tax um, subsidizing that communications fund one of the drivers there was having a monthly briefing newsletter and um, that did um, incur a lot more expense but I know when I'm out in the community and I'm probably probably a lot of you hear this too that a lot of people tell me that they get most of their information from the briefing and they really enjoy that. So I think it is a good way to get information out to the community more on a monthly basis. Um, but uh, we're kind of we're kind of watching to see what happens. Um, there's two different kinds of revenues um, that are coming into the communications fund. So one is the franchise fees, and that is based on the cost to the cable subscribers. And as their rates go up, it does increase the um, amount of revenue that's coming in. And uh, so, as but as people, if they're you know kind of cutting the cord and not having cable, then that's bringing it down. And then there's a peg fee, that's a public um, education government fee, and that's a per that's a flat fee per um, per user. So that one, um, we're not going to see any growth if if uh, cable costs go up. Gotcha. Thank you. And, and uh, Mayor, if I may take one more on there briefly. Um, this might be more for the city manager. Uh, just to refresh my memory, I know in previous years, and especially coming out of the pandemic, um, we had committed to a tax levy stabilization fund that we were going to be kind of doling out over time to buy down these increases. Uh, just uh, where that is at, if if anywhere, and what the tra trajectory may be if we've got funding for future years. Sure. Mr. Mayor and Council Members, Council Member Martin, the tax levy stabilization amount is uh, remaining constant at $1.1 million, and that's a transfer from our strategic priorities fund into the general fund. Um, we had hoped that we were going to be able to sort of gradually ease that down, but given the budget pressures that we have, we're going to rely on the strategic priorities fund for another several years to be able to manage through that. Councilmember Nelson. Yeah, thank you. A couple quick questions here. Um, Golf, you indicated that the tax subsidy or that the, the tax levy was for um, paying down the previous debt from Highland. And, a, and maybe I don't need an answer to this right now. I just hadn't seen that in the budget when I was looking through the 2023 budget book. Um, so maybe I'm just not understanding where that shows up on that, on that, um, the budget that's in our budget book. So, uh, Mayor, uh, Council Members, Council Member Nelson. So, in the Gulf Fund, that was um, comprised of both Dwan and Highland. And so, when we, it's just one fund, it only has one fund balance. And when we were, are looking at the budget and the long term model, we were breaking out the fund balance for Gulf between Highland and Dwan. And on a on a long term model, so and we can we can share this with council like what that looks like, um, 
so even though there's still cash in the in the it didn't go like overall golf did not go negative, but Duan was sort of carrying Highland. So uh, with the revenues over expenses that they were making, so we were um, forecasting that out, and we were we've been tracking, and with the property tax subsidy that we're bringing in, we've been using that to um, add back to the negative balance um, that was offsetting Duan's more positive balance in that of cash. So each year that's getting a bit better, and. Um, now we're not having any activity for Highland, so we because um, Three Rivers has been running that, so we don't have any expenses um, or revenue, and um, we've just been using the tax levy just to kind of um, wipe out that negative balance of of Duan. The reason I ask, I mean, when I'm looking at it, we have salaries and benefits, we have material supplies and services, and we have capital outlays. So I just don't see in the expenses in there where that money is going to that working capital. And, and so maybe that's just something I need to spend a little bit of time individually understanding. Uh, Mr. Rugi? Yeah, Mr. Mayor and Council members, we can, we can show you the long-term model that we have yeah. for that enterprise fund, and that I think does a little bit better job of, of – um, showing visually how that happens. So let, then let me ask this more directly. Absent paying back Highland's losses, is Dwan at least revenue neutral? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, and then uh, regarding the ice garden, um, there's a $125,000 subsidy, but I believe when I looked at it, at least for 2023, we had about 189000 for debt service. Is the ice garden uh, revenue neutral outside of capital needs? So operationally, is it revenue neutral to revenue positive? So... Um Mr. Mayor, Council Members, Council Member Nelson, uh, they do require a that is um, that tax subsidy of one hundred twenty five thousand is needed for operations, um, and then the debt service amount for the ice garden is included in that bottom line. There, it's separated out. So when we have to report our property tax levy, it has to, if it's part if it's paying back debt, it has to be separated out in that line. So that one hundred eighty nine thousand is within that like seven point four million there at the on this table that we're looking at. Okay, thank you for mm -hmm. helping me understand that. Um, and then last question I had to strategic priorities was mentioned previously in the levy. Are we levying for additional money to go into strategic priorities? I understand we're drawing it some down for stabilization, but are we also on the flip side levying? Mr. Mayor and Council Members, Council Member Nelson, you know, we have in the past uh, levied uh, funds to go into strategic priorities. Uh, we have done that uh, around three hundred to five hundred thousand dollars previously. Uh, we are not uh, recommending that we levy for strategic priorities this year. Good, and Thank that you. was a we started this process assuming there would be a component of the levy going into the strategic priorities fund, but based on where we're at right now, that was one of the first reductions that we made. Okay, great. Thank you. Appreciate that information. And one more quick question before we move on. Uh, um, looking at the ice garden, the $125,000. So debt service aside, and if it should, if the, um, the local sales tax should pass and the improvements are made, will there be enough efficiency found in the more efficient systems, the more efficient cooling, and everything that goes on to reduce that $125,000 that is needed for operational costs? Mr. Mayor, uh, council members, let's ask that question again when we do the park and recreation department okay. uh, specific discussion. I think we're a little bit early to know how much savings we're going to realize um, in operations as a result of the new mechanical systems uh, and uh, likely having solar on the building and other uh, improvements that we'll make to Bloomington Ice Garden. I think it's safe to say that we're going to experience reductions in utility costs and operating costs, but we don't know what level that's going to be right. with more efficient equipment. Um, so hopefully we'll have a little bit better feel. I don't know if we'll have a complete answer for you. Thank you. All right. 
Councilor Member Lohman, one more and let's move on. Yeah, uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, so I know that uh, in the last um, uh, budgetary levy uh, last year, uh, we ran into an issue where some of the uh, homes that were underneath that median value uh, saw a substantial increase um, uh, to how much they had to pay in comparison with those that were over that median. Do we think that we're going to see that same um, experience this time around, or is it now we've gotten to a point where that's leveled out and we won't uh, see that? Thank you, Mr. Mayor, uh, Council Members, Council Member Lohman. Um, we would need to go back in and pull out some um, specific types of properties in different uh, in, in different ranges uh, to see. The problem is that when we when we do that sort of like hand picking at different um, uh, value levels, it's um, it, it's hard to get the I don't know the precision, but the the um, sort of the base case that we do with a median value home just because every property has a different valuation uh, adjustment and a different value. So above and below, it's not going to be as demonstrative, but we can certainly do that um, and show you what, you know, some uh, one of the houses and maybe the lowest quartile and maybe one of the upper quartile would be looking at just by pulling an example. Um, but the, I th so I, I don't know if any of those quartiles are moving differently within the um, sales uh, assessment um, adjustments. That's something we'll ask our assessor. Uh, if he's seeing a certain uh, market segment that's moving differently, I think intuitively what we know is that the, the, um, the less expensive homes in the community, I think, are increasing in value probably a little faster than the other um, segments are just because of the demand for entry-level housing. Um, we've heard information before in presentations from our housing team that, um, you know, we have uh, fewer than 100 homes, I believe, now that are less than $200,000, uh, and we're going to see those probably pretty disappearing from the market pretty soon just because of those valuation increases. So we'll work with the assessing team and see what kind of information. Yeah, and I understand get. that it's, it's very similar to the, the survey that we looked at, that it's kind of, that can be misleading. It's not scientific and that kind of thing. So I think we've got to be careful as, as we couch that. But I think the thing I'm, you know, I believe this is Councilmember Nelson, you had brought this up last, last time, last cycle around. Um, and so I, I would be interested to see if we could look at those comparisons um, from the year previous uh, to, to this year, if there's a way to look at those same, um, those same homes at all um, and to see what those comparisons were just for the impact, just so we can understand. I know that's one of our, you know, we talked about that mission that we talked about at the very beginning, you know, in terms of, so I'd be interested in that. Thanks. Thank you, Council Member. Onward. So here's just some other ways to break down the median value home impact. So a 9.49% increase for the property tax levy um, would equate to a 5.65% increase for the median value home. And then also for the median value home, that's $1.45 more per week, $6.28 per month more, or $75.34 per year. Okay, so here is um, an attempt, um, hopefully this will kind of answer Council Member Lohman's questions a little bit, um, just different ways of taking that tax levy increase, it's a little over, or it's over $7 million, it's 9.49% more than the previous um, property tax levy for 2023, and this is taking it and splitting it out by departments. And um, you'll notice that, you know, there's some departments that are not in there because um, like finance, legal, you know, admin, city manager, HR, those because those are the supporting departments that are supporting all of this public departments that, you know, they, those would not exist if it were not for these departments that are serving the community. Um, and so those those are kind of allocated within all of here. But you'll see some kind of dramatic things happening that I want to explain. Um, I'll just start off at, at the top. The reason that community development seems like such a large increase for a tax levy is because, um, so it, 
taxes are not the only type of revenue that come into the general fund. As I said, there's the lodging tax and, um, you know, there's grants, there's admission tax and the permit revenues. And the permit revenues, when we're looking at a tax levy impact by department, those permanent revenues, permit revenues are in community development. So since they're, um, revenues have gone down so much like the amount of taxes that they require to support the service has increased so if that makes sense so that's why um, community development looks um, has a part of this increase in tax levy is, is basically because our here shown with community development is that permit revenue reduction um, and then um, Parks and Recreation and Public Works, it looks like Parks and Recreation has this huge increase and Public Works is going down significantly. And that is because the Park Maintenance Division has moved. Um, they actually moved this year um, physically or, or as far as how their um, reporting is in Parks and Recreation. So Park Maintenance is now part of of the Parks and Recreation Department instead of Public Works. And in the 2023 budget, it was part of the Public Works budget. So that's a little over $7 million. It's mainly um, people, the, the park maintenance staff, uh, both full-time and temporary and equipment. Um, it's And that, um, that shift is what's making the park and recreation jump so big and um, for uh, parks and recreation and then why public works has such a, a um, significant decline but um, so that's what what those are and then and then we've got police and fire and so um, the you know between police and fire um, that's like 4.6 percent of that 9.49 percent increase there so that's split out by department okay and then um also just trying to kind of take that, knowing that there's revenues involved too. It's not just um, property tax revenues, but um, taking all that in and trying to kind of break that out by how that breaks down by category. So um, most of it is salaries and benefits. Most of it is, is people. And that's 5.3%. Then we have internal charges. So, you know, the other... Uh, fund budgets that we'll be looking at, like for example, you know, the facilities is a big one. Facilities fund is an internal service fund that is char has charges into the in um, general fund and um, fleet as well as IT, uh, um, the employee benefits fund. Um, that all shows up there. And then, as I said before, the material supplies and services, what we're seeing, looking at um, increases in there. And then the debt service, that's the same amount as we were looking at before. So we haven't done a breakdown like this before to analyze it, but I'm just trying to show you a different way of seeing how that property tax levy increase breaks out. Mr. Brugge? Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Council Members. I just want to uh, reiterate again on, on the salaries and benefits costs. That's not saying that uh, across the board employees are getting more than a 5% increase. So we have uh, an amount that we're working uh, toward for our negotiations in 2024. I don't want to share with you publicly what, those, what that amount is because we're in the middle of negotiations. But we do have a compensation plan where many of our employees are uh, still within their um, salary range. So for all of our jobs, you know, there's what people start at and then there's a maximum uh, that they can work toward within their, their pay grade. Um, and they move through that range. So the, the you know the difference here between uh, like a normal cost of living adjustment in a given year is about three percent. That's sort of just like the inflationary increase every year. The additional amount that we see is the cost for step what we call step movements um, within pay ranges. So there's a there's a there's an annual adjustment, and then there's movement um, just based on uh, employees. Uh, uh, either their their tenure or their um, performance, because uh, we have both uh, structured within the pay plan. And I was wondering, also looking at that number, uh, how much of this is uh, new firefighter or new police officer, new position costs as well? Can you break it down in that way, just off the top of your head? Uh, 
my recollection, Kari, is that the new uh, employee cost for a firefighter is about one hundred and twenty-five thousand dollars. Is that correct? And that's salary and benefit. A little high. <laughs> okay. So um, we have with the six new firefighters and the, like I said, the dispatcher. Um, so there's probably uh, three quarters of a million dollars just in the salary and benefits there. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Council questions on this? Council Member Carter? Uh, thank you, Mayor. So if you go back to the previous slide, um, going back to the conversation around Parks and Rec and uh, Public Works, I'm curious, um, because it's not, you know, it's not a totally equal um, transition, so there's about a 3% difference, and I'm wondering what that additional 3% is. So, um what is outside of the public works, the park maintenance piece? Sure. So, um, Mayor, Council Members, Council Member Carter. So, definitely within that as well, um, I think police, the police department and the public works department typically have the, the they have the largest amount of employees. So, a lot of that is going to be salary and benefit increases for the both their full time, part time, seasonal um, costs, and and also equipment charges. And they have a lot of the um, like salt and supplies that they use in public works and all of those costs that have been going up, um, those increases are within there. Okay, thank you. Yes, thank you. Councilmember Loman. Thank you, Mayor. So um, as I'm looking at these, these uh, levy pieces here, um, actually, if we just go to that next page where we're at there. So I'm looking at this here, and so I'm thinking about fire stations. I know at one point, um, a while back, we had all those capital expenses that we had, you know, laying out. I think we had a big, big chart. I, I have it somewhere on my wall at home. Um, that wouldn't be here, right? That'd be, or that be, would that be in the debt service, or where would that, where would that be? Yeah. Coming, am I, am I something's it's coming down the line here. <laughs> um. Mr. Mayor, council members, council member Lohman, where we will see the increases for our future fire stations will be in future years debt service needed in the property tax levy. It would be that debt service category. Okay. So that will, that category will increase. And then I also thought, I think I heard the city manager also say that, you know, we're going to be also increasing salaries and dealing with, with fire and police or generally public service. 10 years from now, you know, so that will also play a portion of what will increase in here. Yeah, Mr. Mayor and Council Members, Council Member Lohman, again, if the council um, uh, sticks to the plan that we have laid out for the transition of the fire department, there will be substantial increase in public safety, especially as a percentage of the overall budget uh, over the next decade. I think I'm going to wait for my other question until later on. It, it's going to be on the salaries and benefits because I think I think folks um, look at that number and say, um, in the private sector, which you know we're not the private sector at all, <laughs> no means at all, uh, that 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 number wouldn't be that high. And I, it's not. I know it's not the five five point three percent, but that's you know that that growth rate would, would be a, a bit high to see that. So. Um, so I would like to figure out what is our answer to, to, to that. Um, I already have an answer, but if there is a better answer, um, I'd like to hear it. So, but not necessarily right now. Council Member D'Alessandro. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. <clears throat> um, not as a counterpoint per se to the comment that uh, Council Member Lohman made, but um, data I was just looking at from my company um, says that most folks are, well, most folks, folks in certain industries anyway, are budgeting about a 4.1% increase in salary for 2023. So it's not as far off as we think. Thanks. Okay. So the last thing I have here is just, um, I've shared this with you before, but just bringing this budget calendar forward and we're have worked our way a little way through it from the last time I shared it um, back in April. So We've had the kickoff. We um, have had, you know, the lockout of the departments um, entering in their requests and reviewing everything. We've had the 
meet all the departments have had meetings with the city manager and uh, here we are talking about the preliminary tax levy with our special meeting so september 18th will be when the preliminary tax levy will be set by the council and then october we'll be having some discussions some presentations from the four utility funds for you and then um, also similar to last year some more in-depth presentations from the departments this what i've done tonight has been very high level um, and that will go into into depth, um, especially like in fire and police and parks and recreation, public works. Um, and then November is when the 2024 utility rate public hearing is uh, will be scheduled. We'll have another meeting very similar to this in, on November 20th, um, getting ready to have the council hone in on the final tax levy and budget. And then the truth in taxation public hearing for the 2024 tax levy is scheduled for December 4th. And then all along there, we have public engagement at the bottom. And I think that's my last slide. Yes. And now we get to start discussion. That's what we've been doing all along. <laughs> well, that's fine. <laughs> it's fine to do it along the way. Councilmember D'Alessandro. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I had a quick question on this particular slide on the, on the engagement stuff. Um, Obviously, post tonight, there will be a point of view in the public m sphere. What are you doing differently in your outreach over the course of the these you know these September October timeframes that you're that are more pinned in on? Hey, here's what we proposed. Um, what do you think about that? Are we on the right track? You know that kind of thing. Is there an opportunity to go from kind of a generic? You know, um, like, what do you care about, right? To say, like, we heard you, we've adjusted accordingly. Now, what do you think? If there, if there's an opportunity to do that, I think that might be a really good idea, just so that people know that we're um, asking them to react to what we now have put out there in the public space. And I just didn't know if you were prepared for that or if you had any thoughts on that. Thanks, uh, Mr. Mayor, Council Members, Council Member D'Alessandro. Oh, that that's a good idea. I had not planned on changing what we had for the the budget tables but we could easily make a handout um just talking about where we are proposing it right now and that making sure that everyone is aware that the preliminary uh, budget will be set on september 18th so we could put something together easily even in time for this saturday for our next event yeah if if if, if, if i'm if it makes sense what i'm asking about it it's just i would like um and if we could pin it, you know, come in a little bit closer in right on our pinning down, like, okay, here's what we're thinking. What do you think? And, and give people the opportunity to react to that and also ask questions about it, right? That we may not get from our constituents. You know, we don't always have the expert opinion. <laughs> uh, yeah. Whereas you and, and the folks at man, these tables have a much better point of view on that. Thanks. Thanks. Councilmember Carter. Um, I just have a quick question. So uh, last year when we were having these conversations, we had talked about sidewalk snow plows, and I noticed that that has not been a part of the conversation this year as of now. And um, I think we all remember that that was a frequent issue that we heard about this last winter. And I know part of it is just that the snow melts and it turns to water and then it freezes and it turns to ice. And even if we had the snow plows, I don't know how helpful those would be, but I'm curious in the um, current proposed, uh, the preliminary, or yeah, the preliminary levy, are, are the sidewalk snow plows? No. Okay. All right. Um, is staff working on some kind of maybe solution, innovative solution around this issue that may have costs associated, or are we just kind of at a TBD point? I know it's, it feels like it's almost an impossible situation um, because of, I think, but. I think the honest answer to that is that the budget submitted is exactly the same services that we were providing last year, last winter. So no change to the, the way we're doing that work. Okay, thank you. Council Member Nelson. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Just a few questions. Um, uh, a couple of years ago, we, we hired someone to do grants and sort of the expectation was that at some point they would start to bring in additional grant revenue. Is it possible to get information about 
if we're getting additional grant revenue um, through that position, how much? Is there more that we can do in that area? Mr. Mayor and Council Members, Council Member Nelson, yeah, we have had this discussion at the staff level as we are looking at alternative funding um, opportunities, outside funding opportunities. Uh, Janet is a grant person, and uh, she has been, um, I would say, almost exclusively focused in the first year, year and a half on our grant um on the regulatory and reporting um, aspect of managing our grants. So we haven't gotten to that point yet where she's actively working to go out there and secure uh, or apply for other grants working with departments to do that. That's It's on our work plan. Um, we don't have the capacity for it just yet. Okay. And I appreciate that. And I think from our previous conversations, the, the big burden was the federal grants, obviously, that were extraordinarily large dollar amounts that had a lot of burden in terms of compliance so i'm hope my hope is as that unwinds i mean obviously we won't be getting that money but um that that will uh free up some time to go after some additional money out there so i appreciate that you're working on that um community development uh dropping down to revenues uh i mean to 3.9 million it at what point do we look at expenses if we're going to be 33% below where we were uh, previously in terms of the number of projects and permits and things like that? Obviously, if we don't have the permit revenue, that probably means we don't have the projects. That probably means that there just isn't quite the workload there. Um, uh, and is that something that, that we're looking at going forward, or uh, is this just a temporary blip? Mr. Verbrugge? Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor and Council Members. Uh, Council Member Nelson, that's a really good question. Uh, and I think the, the thing that uh, sometimes uh, folks don't understand when they're thinking about these permit revenues is that our, our revenues, um, the fees are based on the valuation. Okay, And so what we're expecting is that a lot of the large um, high-value projects are going to slow down not necessarily expecting that smaller projects are necessarily going to slow down. So the number of permits may not um, fluctuate that much. So just to give you an example, from 2021 to 2022, our residential um, remodel permits actually did decline um, by 30. But the revenue went up by about 500,000 just because um, there were people were doing larger um, home expansions. Uh, Commercial, however, we only did 61 more permits from one year to the next, but it was $122, $122 million difference. Okay. So the number of projects isn't probably going to uh, uh, change so significantly that we'll be doing a substantial fewer number of inspections. It's the valuation which is driving the fee that's received. I appreciate that. It's almost like the paying permits based on valuation doesn't make a lot of sense, but. <laughs> <laughs> Noted. <laughs> so, but I understand that's state law and we're complying with state law. So um, it's a totally different subject. Um, one of the things that, that we've talked about in the past, um, and, and is it okay if I shift just quickly into discussion? Uh, you know, Obviously, this is a significant amount of money, and we're going to hear about this from people, and, and we should hear about this from people because I'm hearing about it from myself, from my wife, from my friends. You know, this is not this is not a nothing budget in terms of the increase, um, and we're going to do everything we can to to manage that. I know that as a group. But um, one of the things that that I hear from people is okay if our priority is our fire department and and I, it absolutely has to be to that hybrid model I think Chief Seal has made the case for it we've committed to it we know that it's a decade-long process so we're going to add six firefighters for multiple years we're going to keep having these things we have our debt service we have a park master plan we have other things that are going to continue so we're going to have that half a percent to one percent increase every year in the levy just for the debt service we're going to have these things um continue to come forward at, at what point and in what way do we look at are there just things that aren't as high a priority and how do we make those decisions how do we 
take those out of the budget. And extremely difficult. I get it. I get trying to maintain the service level and the services as we have provided them in the past. Uh, but, you know, in one year, okay, maybe it makes sense to have it in this one year. But when I'm looking out that we're talking about this for the next decade, that's a whole different conversation in my mind. And how do we manage that for for our residents and for our businesses. I mean, we, you know, and I appreciate that we look at, you know, what the actual impact is going to be on residents. And let's be honest, it's less than the 9% because other valuations are going up faster. That's going to change in five years, probably. It goes back and forth. And, you know, we, we did a 2.75% levy increase a few years ago and people's taxes went up a lot more than that because commercial <laughs> values dropped um, because we, you know, a bunch of businesses were shut down for a couple of years. You know, and let's be mindful of our business community. I mean, they, they pay these things and they pay significantly. And and that that's not nothing. So I guess my question is, you know, how how do we find areas where we can cut back, where where maybe we don't need to do it, where maybe it isn't as high a priority, and what is our process for doing that? Especially like again, if this was a one time budget, okay, but it's not, and we know it's not. And we've, we've, I think, done it. I mean, staff's done a great job of prepping the community for the fact that we're, we're converting from a paid on call to a hybrid with staffing model in our fire department, and that's going to cost money. We were out there very clearly about the parks master plan, and you know what? We could just redo tennis courts and hockey rinks as they were before, and that would cost us a lot less money than adding bike skills and dog parks and splash pads and community uh, gathering places. There's a cost to all these things. And I just want to make sure we're, we're investing in our highest priorities and we're realistically looking at things that we could cut back on. So that's my comments. Thank you, Council Member, and, and agree with you. And it goes back to our ongoing now, 12-year conversation that I always like to have about the stop doing list. <laughs> and uh, we, we have managed a couple of opportunities through the past couple of years, uh, the closing of the, 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 the DMV, uh, transferring the, uh, the operation of Highland to Three Rivers Park District. And I, I th there must be a couple of others that we could think of. But th the point being, even those were difficult decisions. and frankly, are still controversial in a few ways to a lot of folks. And so it is, it's a difficult conversation. I, I agree with you completely. To, to look at the operation as a whole and say we should stop doing, or uh, we also had the conversation and have in, had in the past, um, is, is A level service necessary? Maybe B minus level service is, is appropriate or acceptable in some cases. And I think we've got to have that, we will over the, the course of the next day, decade, going to have to have that conversation, I think, at some point. Because you're exactly right. This isn't a one-year conversation. This is a decade-long conversation. But um, it's always a difficult conversation. The, the, the stop doing this conversation is never easy, and that's why it has not progressed far, very far in this organization, or frankly, in most organizations. Um, in, in a lot of the public or private sector over the past few years. So, but I agree it, it needs to happen in some way, shape, or form. Councilmember Mua. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I, I was on the Budget Advisory Committee, and leading up to this, I've been having flashback dreams of that <laughs> uh, because it wasn't easy. I think that was one of the most challenging things I've ever done in my life. It was during a pandemic. Uh, we had to understand what residents truly need at a basic level. We weren't trying to go above and beyond and do A-level services for anything during that time. And as I've come on to council and started understanding how we functioned, a lot of the things that we're talking about now are things that are decades in the working. Having a, a full-time fire department, that probably should have been done 20 years ago, 30 years ago. And so you know, one of the, the comments that one of our other uh, commission member said is, you know, we can put, you know, things off like roads for a long time and that'll keep taxes low, but eventually the piper is going to come and say, hey, where's my due? And we happen to be stuck right in the middle of it. Mm -hmm. This is a community that's over 90,000 people now with services that are essential and are needed with our police, our fire, our parks and recreation that haven't been invested in for decades. 
and now we're stuck with the bill because it's come due and residents are asking. They've prioritized and showed us directly what's important to them. And they're telling us exactly the level that they're looking for. And they're not looking for C level. They're not looking for third string bench runners. They're, they're looking for us to step up and be uh, the city of choice where they want to be because that's what they've become accustomed to. And so that is the challenge. How do we support the investments that are needed, that are long overdue, uh, without overburdening, especially with the new families coming in. In the last two years, I've seen more families that moved into my neighborhood than ever before. And so those families are looking for reasons to stay here. And if we don't give them reasons to stay here, they're going to leave. If we give them reasons to keep leaving to go somewhere else, they're just going to decide to stay somewhere else. And so I'm looking forward to the challenges this is going to bring, but I'm also very conscious of the pocketbooks of our taxpayers, because I can't leave Cub without spending at least $250, and my kids aren't even teenagers yet. <laughs> and so uh, I understand the challenges that are coming in the, the future here, um, and looking forward to it. But I, I think we definitely need to find a good way to balance the needs um, without significantly impacting uh, our residents. Councilmember D'Alessandro. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And yeah, I agree with you very much, uh, Councilmember Mua. I think the other thing that um, I find always fascinating when I'm looking at our budget is that, you know, close to 75% of the budget is is in the categories we absolutely expect it to be every time, right? We have police, fire, public works, and um, uh, our capital improvement projects. It kind of, like, no matter how I slice it. I can't get past the fact that over 75% of this budget is just doing the things that people tell us all the time we need to do, whether that's make sure the water's good and the snow is plowed and the policemen have all of the things that they need to be good at their jobs or that we have, um, you know, the ability to, um, react appropriately and professionally and capably um, when there's a, a fire or something like that. And so um, I, I, so we get to, you know, when you think about that number, now you take 25% of that number and then you ask us what we stopped doing. And truthfully, you know, if we divided that by the not even including the commercial folks, we divided it by the 23,000 homeowners that pay taxes. On a per taxpayer basis, it's not very big and it gets hard. It gets really hard because you almost feel like you're um, picking nits, if you will. Um, because, you know, you could, you could maybe, like a good example of this was, you know, as Councilmember Carter mentioned, maybe we stop plowing residential sidewalks because. By the way, we're not supposed to be doing that anyway because in our in our actual ordinance it says residents are responsible. So maybe we stop doing that. Okay, sure. That might help us get better coverage on the places where we must do that, like around public schools and places like that. But I don't think it takes a point off the levy by a long, long way. So, you know, we could do that. I'm all for it. Like, let's put that on the table. And maybe we could find two or three or four of those and we'd get a point off the levy. But I I don't know how we get from 9% to 3%, which is what everybody wants to pay. I just don't know how you do it. Um, if anybody does know, we'd love to hear about it. But, you know, again, it's not 100% we're looking at. We're looking at that 25% of the numbers um, unless we want to start, you know, degrading the services that – Bloomington has become known for and has pride about and is, you know, uh, above and beyond um, most folks in the, in the, in the Twin Cities and the Metro. Um, you know, I, I, I don't want to see that happen because I moved here for those reasons and so many other people moved there for those reasons. You know, a third of our, a third of our, our, our city is set aside for, for green space. Well, that takes a lot of time, energy, money, and investment to maintain. So you could, you could get rid of a few of those. <laughs> I'm not voting for that. I don't know about you all. Um, you know, I mean, you could, right? We could sell it, sell the land off to the highest bidder and turn it into something else. 
uh, you know, I don't think that that's what the people in this community want from us. They live here as opposed to somewhere else because those parks are here. Um, and uh, so um, I, I just put out, I'll just put it out to anyone who wants to sit down and help me figure out how to find places to cut. But we're not talking about, you know, 100% of this 9% number. We're talking about 25% of that 9% number on the table. Thanks. Thank you, Council Member. Other thoughts, Council? Council Member Loman? I'll go. Um, you know, so, I mean, I... You know, I mean, the thing that, that always resonates with me is, uh, you know, when I'm, you know, at the doors, I know a number of you are at the doors, too, and you you have that, uh, you know, elder, uh, uh, older person um, at the door, and I'm getting closer to those, <laughs> to, the, to that uh, age range myself, uh, and, and the person tells you, hey, you know, gosh, you know, my... Uh, I, I bought this house. It was at this value, and I appreciate the idea that you guys have been able to bring the, the value of my house up. Um, but at this point, you know, on my fixed income, this is really difficult to be able to try to get by. And then, you know, and then you try to balance that, you know, with what uh, Council Member, you know, Mua just, uh, you know, brought forward, you know, in terms of that that balance, in terms of making this place an attractive place that, that folks want to be at. And I think those are the things that that you know. You know, because so Del Sandro talked about that as well. That 25% that's 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 out there, that brought my family here uh, so many years ago, and so we have to, you know, try to invest in what's uh, coming forward. And and there are people are asking very valid questions. You know, I, I, and so one thing I would ask as we we put together the, you know, as we look into the future along this this budget calendar. Is um, and I think uh, Councilman Delisandro really put it well. You know, uh, in, in my business where I'm at, we do do surveys. You know, in terms of salary, um, to look at those salaries uh, to, to see, hey, here's how we. And I, I want to be careful because you know the city of Bloomington is really different than really any other um, city that you'll find in, in Bloomington. But I think it gives a uh, it gives our residents an understanding of you know the value at which the investment that they they're making. Uh, in the city that we have here. And so if we want really good employees, this is what it's going to cost. And uh, if you look at, um, uh, you know, I, I just tend to think, hey, we need to pay our, our, uh, our staff, um, you know, what the market demands. And if that means we've got to be at the top end of that, um, I think that, you know, you get what you pay for. Um, and so, um, I'm okay with that. Um, I'm okay with, you know, in 2023, we, you know, put together a, you know, a public safety piece that was about 68% of our budget or thereabouts. Um, I'm okay with, with, with those types of investments. And I do know that as we look in the out years, um, that we're going to have to make some very difficult decisions. And I just hope that, you know, this council uh, and future councils uh, we'll continue to, to, to look at that balance and be looking to uh, invest in those, those, those years that are coming um, by the decisions that we, we make today. Um, so I, 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 you know, again, manager, I know I've asked you in the past this many a times, uh, but, uh, you know, I, I don't want to look at just one year, you know, as much as we can, if we can look at the next year, which is, is, is a difficult ask because I know so many things change. From year to year, and we we were schooled in that when we had the the pandemic. <laughs> um, but I do think it just makes more sense to kind of think of these things on an ongoing basis uh, of how many years out that that's going. So, in terms of where we're at today with this, I, I'm okay. But I still think we do need to press to figure out what things that we can um, on the on the, the stop doing list that the, the Bussies list that he had in the past. Um, and so. Um, you know, I can, I can support where we're at today, but I, I think we just you need to continue to look at this list. I know we've got a new paradigm. You know, the mayor talks about that as well, and I, I want to support that as well. But I think that that's what people are asking for us is to kind of really lay this out, kind of explain why we're doing what we're doing, um, and, and and then I think they'll be where we're at uh, with this. So that's those are my thoughts. Mr. Rugi. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Council Members. Council Member Lohman, appreciate that. And so I had responded earlier that we have some larger context, right, to discuss. Um, you know, we we do look around at our peer communities to see where they're at on a year-to-year -year basis. Uh, none of that is to justify um, 
whatever we're putting forward as a proposal. It's just to get an understanding of what's driving the decisions that cities everywhere are facing right now. Um, so, the, you know, when I say peer communities, I'm talking about metro cities that are uh, generally greater than 50,000 population. And we're the largest of them, but, you know, that's kind of who we sort of compare ourselves to. <clears throat> the uh, lowest among that group is five and a half percent and that's just for and that's insure, increased insurance uh, and utility uh, costs and and existing staffing complements so that's no ads uh, one's at 6.75 percent and that's a status quo budget no, nothing additional beyond what they currently have uh, and then just about everything else is above that um, and so the themes here will sound familiar. Uh, one of them is at about seven uh, and three quarters, uh, five and a half with the base, and then two and a quarter for a public safety master plan, which is adding police and fire. One of them is 8.4% added personnel costs and a new fire station. One of them is at 7.6%, uh, 12 additional FTEs, mostly police and fire. Uh, one is at seven this year and over eight um, in the subsequent year uh, with about two and a half percent for park improvement bonds. Okay. Um, one is at about 10 percent transition to full-time fire park bond referendum full year costs of mid 2023 hires. I mean every city that's in the survey is basically having the exact same uh, challenges that the city of Bloomington is and we're roughly in the same place in terms of what those levy proposals are. So this is not unique to the city of Bloomington. This is not something um, that uh, we are doing that is an outlier from what's being experienced in communities around the Twin Cities. Um, this is where we're at. People are making investments in public safety. Uh, communities that are aging are reinvesting in the communities, and we have the pressures of uh, increased costs associated with uh, trying to recruit and retain really good employees. No, thank you uh, for that, city manager. I just saw, you know, and this is not in that same peer group, but I saw one city that lost their entire police department. Uh, you know, they just were trying to, you know, get keep their, and I, I'm not saying that we're, <laughs> we're going to get to that, that point, but, you know, I think that's an example of where you say, hey, we're going to, you know, tighten this belt so hard uh, that you end up paying a lot more uh, than what you already were at right today. So I, I'd rather just assume uh, have this conversation today uh, than uh, have that conversation later on. Councilmember Carter. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I, I feel like I agree with a lot of what has been said already. Um, I have also been doing a lot of door knocking lately, and um, and based on what I'm hearing at the doors and based on the community engagement input, um, I mean, overall, it really does feel like people love living in Bloomington. They love the amenities that they have available to them, and they think that the city is doing a really good job. And, and I agree with Councilmember Mua. I don't think that uh, the residents of Bloomington would be okay with sea level service. And going back to Councilmember Dallas Under's point, it really does leave that 25% of our budget, um, which I think probably almost half of that is Parks and Rec, which we just heard was one of the top priorities for our residents. And so um, I do think we're in a really tough position. I think we've made that super clear at this point. Um, I guess I am curious if there are things left over from the Community Budget Advisory Committee list of items that we didn't consider. I mean, we didn't choose them at that time, so I would assume that we would not choose them now. Um, but, you know, something to consider. And then I also um, just encourage staff, I think that staff in the city do a really good job of this anyway, but to con con continue to look for other revenue opportunities, um, including, you know, are there things that we should be adding to our policy agenda at the state and the national level to advocate for more resources for local government, which, as you just mentioned, like obviously there's a trend, right? We need more support in local government. And I know the changes to local government aid this last legislative session will help, but um, it feels like not enough. Mm -hmm. And so um, those are some of my thoughts. And then also to Council Member Lohman's point around staff salaries, my understanding is that there will be a market study done in 2024. And so then I think that we'll have a better sense too of how we compare to cities around us and um, that'll be helpful. So those are my thoughts. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Mr. Ruggie. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Council Members. Council Member Carter, two uh, uh, 
good discussion topics. Related to the Community Budget Advisory Committee and whether there are any recommendations that came from CBAC that the council may want to revisit, um, council members will recall that we tiered the recommendations at the time. So there was a Group A, a Group B, and a Group C. The Group A is ultimately what was selected. Um, it was significant cuts. We had 23 FTE that were eliminated as a reduction as a as a result of those recommendations, and uh, the recommendation from CBAC and the agreement with the council at the time is uh, there wasn't much of a desire to go beyond those um, those options. Uh, you might recall last year that the CBAC. Um, issue was raised again if there's something and and we shared those recommendations i did not hear anything back from council members that there was anything in that group b or group c that folks were interested in pursuing um, we can certainly um, recirculate that and if council members do see something there we can pursue that during the course of conversation here over the next couple of months in terms of other government funding for projects uh, that's an excellent question because there is a significant amount of uh, uh, funding that is going to be flowing from the federal government with the IRA and the IIJA, um, the infrastructure improvement, um, uh, I don't remember what the J is for, Jobs Act, thank you. Uh, and so uh, there's a lot of federal money in the system right now. Um, we're going to, we're working with our federal lobbyists to identify um, where those opportunities are. Um, I think one of the greatest opportunities for us is not in an area that's going to alleviate much cost or or um, take um, project you know supplement uh, the f local funding for projects we were doing anyway but I think it's in the area of solar um, that we may be able to expand um, our our utilization of solar faster as a, as a result of those federal funds if we're successful in pursuing those uh, and the council is aware that we have uh, submitted um, uh, we've submitted a uh, request to the state of Minnesota for uh, capital uh, bonding uh, in the 2024 session that is commensurate with the size of Bloomington in the state of Minnesota and the resources that are being allocated to the larger cities. So in cities of Rochester, St. Paul, Minneapolis, and several cities smaller than Bloomington actually received quite a bit more in terms of capital bonding than what Bloomington received in 2023. Uh, we we have about $45 million in requests that we've put forward, and uh, hopefully some of those will come through. Where that's likely to help us is um, uh, supplant, uh, supplanting some uh, general fund bonding cost, but also in our utility rates because several of them are utility projects that will be hopefully able to ease um, future increases in, in our utility services because of uh, those projects potentially being funded. So yes, we are pursuing both federal and state outside funding to try and alleviate some of the burden of local taxpayers and local ratepayers, and that's both at a, a, a residential and at a commercial um, level. Thank you, Mr. Brugge. Councilmember D'Alessandro. The, the one thing I think that, uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, sorry. Um, the one thing that I um, I do want to make a note of, and I think, um, Ms. Carlson, you mentioned it a minute ago when we were talking about this. We, we, um, we know that there are different things we need to fund than we did five years ago. And it's not just at the capital level, but it's as a result of things like um, our drought um, that's called an emerald ash borer that's causing a significant impact to our trees. Um, uh, you know, I don't see anything in here for, you know, the continued funding of, of more work in the natural resources department for another forester to kind of help us get in front of those really significant issues. Um, I don't recall where I was when this conversation happened. I apologize, but somebody that I was talking to recently, um, maybe it was at National Night Out, actually told me that they were driving down um, Lindale Avenue and one of the trees fell over right behind their car. I mean, if it had been within five seconds on either end, it could have been a significant issue. Um, so, you know, with the amount of trees that are dying in, in uh, and we need to get them, we need to get that canopy replaced. Right? We can't just say we're going to pull them out and leave them there. We need to get them replaced. Uh, in fact, two for every one would be my idea. Um, but they need to be of a diversity 
right? That allows us to mitigate some of this stuff. So, you know, over and above just talking about what we stop doing, it's a lot, to me, it's a lot about like, because we're stopping doing this and we're starting doing this, maybe the number doesn't change, but the philosophy behind what we're spending that money on is what's changing. And that you can point to, to, to that, right? We stopped doing X because you to, you know, we all know we need to do Y. Um, and I'd be very interested in any of those kinds of, of projects as well. So that if we are asking for this kind of money anyway, we're able to point to it much like we did last time, right? We said 9.15%. Sorry, that sucks. We're all house owners too here, so it sucked for all of us. Um, 4% of that went, or, you know, 4% to fire, 4% to to police, and the other 1% to natural resources. Like, we knew that. And I feel confident that we can have another conversation like that with people. So not only understanding what the numbers are, um, but understanding how they're being applied um, so that when we say, yep, those salaries are going up for those workers, but the ones that we're, the ones that we're investing in are the ones that are doing the work that you want us to do. That would be very helpful. Thanks. And by the way, I apologize, Mr. Mayor. It's just a discussion. So I don't know if, was there a particular ask out of tonight that, like, was there a particular question or two that you wanted to make sure we all answered for you? No, I think this is, uh, I think this this is exactly what we were looking okay. for. I'm okay, assuming great. this is what uh, we were listening to the staff information that we have to this point, And this is the discussion we were looking for. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah, Mr. It. Mayor and Council Members, Council Member D'Alessandro, thank you for asking that specific question because maybe we haven't been clear. So the next step for us, obviously, is that we're going to come back and ask the Council to adopt a preliminary levy, which is required uh, by the end of September. I think we're looking at our meeting on September 18th is when that action would be before the Council. Uh, so what we're what we're wanting to get out of this conversation is a sense from you that uh, we're in the right range here. So when we come back and ask you to adopt that preliminary levy, um, that we don't have any surprises. You're not surprised by what you see. We're not surprised by um, how you're responding to it. So if if there is a number, if this number is not the right number, um, up or down, uh, that you give us that direction tonight so we know what to prepare for on September 18th. Um, and then obviously, We'll continue to work over the next several months. Uh, Councilmember D'Alessandro's uh, comments about areas that um, maybe we should be doing more uh, work in because of things that are affecting the community, uh, conversations that I think are not um, unfamiliar to any of you, right? And I'm sure there are some other areas besides forestry or sustainability um, that council members are interested in looking at. Um, the, you know, the numbers. Uh, this year, I feel a little bit more confident that the numbers are not going to change too much over the last uh, few months of the year, unless something pretty dramatic happens with, say, interest rates um, or inflation, um, because the, one of the big drivers here, frankly, is development cycle and uh, how the market is responding to those inflationary pressures. Uh, if there's suddenly a lessening of that, that may cause us to revisit some of our assumptions going into 2024. But right now, um, I think we have a pretty clear-eyed view of what's happening. So I think the, over the course of the next couple months, what we'll be wanting to talk to the council about is uh, the more of the specific detail within the departments, especially the departments that are driving uh, most of the budget increases. Uh, a number of departments here are just, uh, I don't like to use status quo, but in terms of the, the impact from a cost perspective, it's, it's pretty nominal, right? And so I don't know that we need to go back and have a whole conversation around 1% uh, departmental increase if it's just the same staffing complement and same assumptions on you know, what their operating costs are going to be. Um, but for the departments where we're seeing a, a more of a, a dramatic shift uh, or um, change in costs, we probably want to talk about that a little bit more over the next couple of months and then uh, maybe go a little bit deeper in some of, the, some of the ideas that council members have expressed about things they'd like us to look at. Councilmember Mua and then Councilmember Nelson. Councilmember Mua. Thank you, Mayor. And this question is for the city manager. Just um, so I remember correctly, when we set the preliminary budget, that means that's the, the cap, right? We can't go above that. Um, we can always work down from it. And so, um, so we wouldn't want to preemptively lower the preliminary budget or the preliminary levy right away in case something popped up and then we're stuck because we can't go over that. Is that correct? Mr. Mayor, Council Members, Council Member Mua, that is exactly correct. 
Uh, we cannot go higher than the number that is adopted in September. You can decrease it. Um, and that's why we have those discussions over the subsequent months to get a little more into the details. And then it's likely going to be the first meeting in December that we would ask the council to act on the final budget. And that will usually coincide with our um, truth and taxation hearing, um, which is a required step in the process as well. Councilmember Member Nelson. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Uh, just a quick point to the uh, city manager's comments with regards to inflation, but um, would note that the um, Minneapolis, St. Paul, Bloomington area CPI in May was 1.8% and lately was 1%. Um, this region has done a good job of controlling inflation, um, largely due to a lot of uh, policies that we've looked at in terms of housing. And housing was driving inflation significantly for people, the cost of housing. And so I, I applaud this council for doing that. I don't know that it impacts our budget, but it came up and I just wanted to note that. And I think, um, you know, it's a question that we get in terms of cost drivers for the individual tax pair and you know what are we doing with this housing policy and having more housing well if we can keep housing costs from going up 10 percent a year that's going to help you on your property taxes and so that we're seeing that impact here already so mr Brugge. thank you mr mayor uh council member nelson it's a good point especially on just the inflation for the um, the, the twin cities market uh, comments that other council members have made tonight about additional pressures that residents face, whether they go into the grocery store or buying other necessities, um, that's that's where people are going to be beneficiaries of that as it reduces some of that additional pressure. Um, so that that is good news for our community and the larger Twin Cities community. Councilmember D'Alessandro. Yep, thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. Um, Councilmember Nelson's um, comments made me think of something else. You know, given that we ha we do have that kind of that like regional benefit there, um, um, how how quickly can we move if it if at all um, as a as a city entity to um, uh, source materials that in a way that might help us? And what I mean by that is, you know, maybe it's not relevant at the larger scale, but, you know, if people who are sourcing, if we are sourcing things from local providers and that inflation is lower, that CPI is lower here, that means that the price we pay if we buy right around here is going to be less than if we imported it from the coasts or whatever. And I don't know if that makes a difference. And I don't know if we can get anything here that we really are talking about when it comes to those types of things. But I, I also don't know how quickly we can move as a as a sourcing entity anyway, given that we're a municipal government to try to take advantage of that kind of stuff. But I would be certainly very interested if we got innovative on that front and, and looked at, you know, sourcing from local providers or, you know, um, um, maybe there's an equity opportunity or something like that that would be useful to us to be, um, be you know, trimming, uh, taking advantage would be a better way to put it of that, that you know, kind of, um, good job as council member nelson described it as as trying to keep uh, consumer prices at a steady state so um i don't know if we get the chance to do that um but i think it would be cool if we did so sure. I'll throw that out there as a place to look sure. mr Brugge. thank you mr mayor and council members council member d'alessandro um very interesting question uh, rather than swag it for you i'm gonna uh, maybe follow up and talk to our purchasing folks um, because I think a lot of the materials that we purchase are more about you know the supply chain and, and where we get those materials from. Uh, but the comment about locally sourcing things or uh, incorporating an equity component into our purchasing is actually something that is in our um, in our work plan for our, uh, racial equity strategic plan, and um, we are um, planning on. Um, participating in a study that will help us get the data at a local level to justify the um, creation of such a policy. But we have to have data, and it takes us a while to get that data, and those studies are not done on, a, on a, um, an annual basis. So there, uh, we'll probably jump in with some other cities in the region um, to do that kind of study, and so we're, I think we're probably a couple years out before we know that. Council, anything else? 
think uh, the final question that I had, without you know jumping too far ahead in the book, because we don't want to spoil anything, as we look toward October on our discussion about utility rates, uh, because we, we have had the discussion in the past about the total cost of government. It's not just the tax levy. It is the utility rates as well and the different pieces of the puzzle that, uh, that it all takes. Do we have any idea what our utility rates will be looking like for next year? Um, Mr. Mayor and Council Members, uh, or, um, we do. I don't have that on top of my head, but we've, we've had all those budget meetings, and we, um, I don't know if you recall, Jamie, the range. Okay. Oh. Okay. Um, but we, we can we have that information we can share with you. And we'll have that conversation in, in October. I get that. So thank you. All right. Well, thank you. Look forward to this continued conversation and uh, appreciate the, the information tonight and appreciate the, the council discussion tonight. It's been very uh, thoughtful and insightful and, and a useful conversation, I'm sure, for staff and uh, for us as policymakers. And I, and I hope for residents as they get to see once again, as Councilmember Lohman likes to keep pointing out this, uh, when we start to televise the, the sausage making, <laughs> this is what the sausage making looks like. And uh, it's a good discussion. And I think it's, it's a worthwhile thing for people to see how we come to the decisions that we ultimately come to. So well done. Thank you for, for the conversation this evening on this. Our only other item on tonight's agenda is uh, our city manager and council update. I have nothing. Mr. Verbrugge, nothing. Council, anything? Very good. If that is nothing else, we've completed our agenda. I'd look for a motion to adjourn tonight. So. Motion and a second to adjourn. No further council discussion. All in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 7 0. Again, thanks so much for the discussion, Council. Thank you, Kari, and thank you for uh, all the staff work that has gone into that budget, which I know just doesn't fall from the sky. A lot of work goes into that. So thank you very much. Thank you.